Welcome to Inside Healthcare. Opiates continues to pose a major health concern in this country. A new documentary currently under production by Minnesota native and award-winning filmmaker Joe Carlini tells a personal story of a 25-year-old man and his drug addiction that ended sadly this year. Here's a preview of Josiah's story. Josiah, he was just a good, good kid. A kid that just loved life and lived it to the fullest extent uh, in every aspect. He was always the life of the party. He was the class clown every single year. On a down day would just bring a smile to your face because of his laugh. He was everybody's friend, always played sports, always made straight A's. I don't think he had one single enemy. Everybody who ever knew Josiah loved Josiah. Drugs doesn't play favorites, it will hit anybody and everybody. When we found out that our son was on drugs, he was off at college. The feeling was complete isolation and terrified and your whole world is shattered. Anybody and everybody who is close to the addict, it affects everybody. I had the stigma of drugs that anybody who was on drugs came from the streets. And it's not necessarily the truth. I mean, it can affect anybody. It affected me. It affected um, our house. It affected our kids. Um, it affected my wife and I. And it affected our community. To see your son, who you have to kick out of your house, be homeless, it, it changes every part of an American family. And for the worst, obviously, it, it wrecks your home. It has the ability to wreck your home. My son's story can get out to the public and let them know that don't sweep this under the rug. That admit that we have a problem and let's let's uh, let's work on it and, and come through and and get and come away with a good outcome. We would like you to partner with us and to jump aboard with us and try to put the word out there to let other families who are going through this understand. Get inside of a family who has gone through this. It's a story that should not go untold. It's a story of, of small town America coming out. I mean, we hear of these stories all the time in the big cities, and, and sometimes your little small town areas, just nothing ever is, is said or exposed about that. And other families who experience this, other families who don't know anything about drugs, don't know anything about what to do with their kids on drugs, we want to put our story out there to help any and everybody that we can. One kid, one, one girl, one man, any, anybody we possibly can would mean a life not lost. If our story, if Josiah's story can help even one person, but I want it to help many people, we're willing to put our story out there to try to help, to try to make a difference. Drug addiction kills 70,000 people already this year and it's something that we need to jump on board with. And so I'm just asking anybody and everybody that will to jump on board with us and help us get this word out, help us make a change in our country, in your neighborhood. You never know if it's gonna to happen to you. So to talk about this issue, we're pleased to be back with Dr. Carolyn McLean, the Medical Director of Urgency Room here in Venice Heights, and we're talking about opiates. So this new federal law just was passed or signed into law. What does this mean here locally for us? So the most important thing that this law did was at least start to address that this is a major health problem in this country, and that's a great first step. And the second thing it did was dedicate some money to treatment of opiate abuse, which is great. It's crazy how, yeah, it's really become such a public health issue here in this country. Well, and one of the challenges is you see it, I mean, for me, this feels like the most important issue that medicine's facing and, and our public health is facing, but 
that's because that's what I do every day. But it is just great that they're focusing some money towards treating opiate addiction because there's really very few places you can send people for help. So someone has been in an accident or they have an injury and they have this pain, they come go to the urgency room for, how do you guide them on how to treat this pain, especially with opiates being available as a tool? So, so it's always a challenge because you certainly don't want people to suffer. And with acute pain, what you want to tell people is that acute pain is telling you that something is wrong in your body. For instance, you break your arm. Your, the, the reason you have pain is you should not be using that arm. And that's helpful so that you remember that your arm needs protection. Mm -hmm. But what you, you want people to have is most of the day, you can distract yourself from that pain. And ibuprofen is actually, if you can take it, which is always a challenge because not everybody can take that medicine, but it's a wonderful medicine for pain. But what I tell people is the, the biggest challenge is when you can't distract yourself and it's at night. And in order to heal, you do need a good night's sleep. So I recommend that the only time you take your opiates is to get a good night's sleep because then at least you maybe take two in a day mm -hmm. and you actually can handle that experience of pain a lot better if you've gotten some sleep. And this is something that's very common after surgery too. I mean, we were mm -hmm. talking about accidents and injuries, mm -hmm. but surgery is another time that people might want to be taking opiates mm -hmm. and painkillers to get a good night's sleep and to deal with that pain. Yeah, and so, so what you want to give people is as many tools as they can use while they're awake to distract them from the pain. So things just as simple as ice, ice works really well. Really, how does that help with the pain? <laughs> it, <Death numbs. laughs> yeah. it numbs the, the actual pain Receptors. neurons okay. so they don't fire. So you don't feel that much pain. It's hard to keep ice on something for a long time, but it really does help. Um, and then just distraction and understanding that this, this pain is not something to be afraid of, because pain causes a lot of anxiety and fear. Like, what's wrong with me? Why do I hurt this much? So sometimes just identifying what's causing the pain. Because so it's not as, it's, it's a little easier in something like a surgery or a broken bone because it's very clear what's causing it. Mm -hmm. But things like kidney stones, when people come in, oh, they've yes. never had one before. I hear it's one of the most painful things you can and have. It's, you've never had it. You don't know, you just know, my gosh, something's really wrong. And the pain can be various places, mm -hmm. right? But it's very helpful to just say, this is what it is, this is how long it's gonna last, this is what to expect. And then at least people go, the fear part of the pain is taken away. And they can, most people can manage without opiates most of the time. And what I tell people to do is when I prescribe them is have this as a backup for when you really can't take it. And a lot of times what happens is people are like, I didn't use it. Okay. You know, because they, if you know that there's some way to get out of this if mm. it's helpful to have that. But the other thing we really try to do is prescribe as few as possible. I was gonna ask, how do you prevent that overuse or misuse of it? And so some of, some of the issue is, is most people use opiates appropriately and then they don't use them all. And then they sit in their medicine cabinet and it's very common for family members or your carpenter or someone else in that it, it has access to your home to get to those opiates. Yeah, I think public health, they always recommend you, you turn them into the county. There's mm -hmm. various locations around mm -hmm. the state that you can do that. Mm -hmm. So good idea. So um, after they've been prescribed, and uh, now you don't see or do you see the patients repeated, maybe if they have like kidney stones or something, you only see them once or twice, as opposed to someone that may go to a clinic or something like that? Right, so, so, so you don't know that much about the patient as well, right? But you try to learn as much as you can. Uh, most patients, it's the first and only time I will see them. Yeah. But we do have uh, 
state registry of opiate prescriptions. So if you were a patient that came to see me before I prescribed opiates, I would, by law, it's expected that I would look up and see how many opiates has Jody had mm -hmm. this year. And that's very helpful because if you, if it starts to be, wow, this is the 10th prescription this year for different problems, we need to say, hey, maybe this isn't, you are using these opiates inappropriately, or we're not actually having the conversation. Because most people are innocently mm -hmm. becoming addicted. They're not. That's what I understand, yeah. And what is it about the opiates that is addictive in, in nature? Yeah, so they, they, so how they work is they block a receptor in your brain that interprets and tells your brain you have pain. And that receptor is called the mu receptor. So they make it so that you don't know you have pain, but they are not specific. So pain is all kinds of things, including emotional pain. And so when you take an opiate, you feel better, not just from pain, you just feel better that particular day. And what happens over time, so, so people like that feeling. They like that, oh, I feel good now. Um, but over time, your body says, hey, I'm still getting these signals that there's pain somewhere. And so they, they go, well, my receptors aren't working. I better make a lot more. And so every time oh, wow. you take an opiate, your body goes, hmm, this is, something's wrong still. And so they make more receptors. So you, over time, need more and more opiates to block all of those receptors. And that's where this use of more and more and more comes from. And it's a natural process. Your body is trying to do a good job so because we need to have pain to protect ourselves. But it, it's not working when you're constantly blocking those receptors. Are there alternatives that work as well or can help alleviate pain? So ibuprofen, how that works is it quiets down the actual neurons that send the signal that there's pain. So it's going right to that spot. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people can't take ibuprofen for a number of reasons. Um, but ibuprofen's great, and then there are some other medications that we have that are, one's called gabapentin, which quiets down those same nerves. Mm -hmm. And then there's kind of like a Novocaine, it's called a lidocaine patch oh, that I've you can them, yeah. put right on the area that's causing pain. The challenge is some of these alternatives are really expensive. So when you look at how much does a opiate prescription cost, it costs a dollar. How much does one lidocaine patch? It can cost up to $20. No, oh, wow. So it's very, depending on what insurance you have, you may or may not be have access to those alternative forms of medication. And what if you're allergic to Tylenol or ibuprofen and it makes it more challenging? So that's the balance that we're always, how safe is it for me to give this patient this prescription? And I certainly don't want them to suffer, but I don't want to create a new problem in the long run. But if they have any questions or concerns, they should come see you at the urgency room. Absolutely, yeah. You can help them out. Mm -hmm. So, um, Other things that our viewers should know about you know, opiates and, and keeping the, themselves and their families safe? I think that um, if, if you can avoid taking an opiate at any time, that's the right thing to do. Um, but you should also be gentle with yourself if you, if you are having a tremendous amount of pain, if you have a kidney stone or some, something that requires opiates, just really consciously use them and think about, are there any other things I can do? I mean, we always say meditation's wonderful. Well, it is, but not if you start doing it during a kidney stone. You have to be, you have to be prepared. Yes, um, because once it's going, it's, <laughs> it's really the, yeah. difficult. So I think as long as you are really present when you decide, I need this medicine and I'm taking it for the right reasons, it should be safe. And um, the urgency rooms are at three locations. Yes. In the yeah, we have one in Van Nuys Heights. Where we're at right yeah, now. And one in Egan and one in Woodbury. And we're open 8 to 10 every single day. 
Dr. Carolyn McLean, thank you for being with us. Always great information. Thank yep, you. Thanks. We'll be right back with more right after this. Disaster tips from the objects left behind. My home wasn't insured, but you can check your insurance policy now to make sure you're covered. Oh. My savings are lost, but you can put money aside and plan for unexpected disaster costs. We're lost forever, but you can scan important documents now so they survive. For more tips on how to prepare, visit ready.gov. Now we turn our attention to Special Olympics and Polar Plunge, and we're pleased to have back with us our good friend Katie Barton with Special Olympics, as well as she's brought some friends with her, Molly Egan and Officer Mike Short Reed with the Maplewood Police Department. Correct. So glad to have you with us and excited to talk about this. Thanks for having us. Uh, first of all, uh, most people are probably familiar with Special Olympics, but just briefly, what is it and how does the Polar Plunge fit into all of this? Yeah, so Special Olympics and the National Organization but our Minnesota office, we have over 8,200 athletes, so it's an organization for those with intellectual disabilities. And so we have our sports competitions, which a lot of people know about, right. um, you know, local competitions, state competitions, but we also have a lot of different programs too. Um, we have healthy athletes, we have a SOFIT program, we have um, athlete leadership programs, a lot of unified schools and unified programs, so it really is all around and a lot more um, than what people think of, of just our sports competition. And the Polar Plunge, what's that all about? I will go with that one. The okay. Polar Plunge is actually one of the largest fundraising events that the law enforcement torch run does for Special Olympics in the state of Minnesota. Um, it's presented by law enforcement. Um, you know, when you hear about the law enforcement torch run, which usually occurs in the month of June in the state of Minnesota, it's the actual run that goes into the summer games and you know, brings in the flame of hope into that opening ceremonies. Oh, I love that. Um, yeah. The Polar Plunge, like I said, it's one of the largest fundraising events that we do throughout the year. And it's not just one plunge. I mean, in any given year, we have over 20 different plunges statewide. And that's just in Minnesota alone. Just you were telling Minnesota. me even internationally it's been. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so why a plunge? I mean, what's the whole idea behind that? I guess that? the best way to describe that is we're in the state of Minnesota. I mean, the lady <laughs> of course, state why of 10,000 lakes, <laughs> it's like, it, it's a perfect idea. Um, actually, the original plunge for the state occurred right here in Wiper Lake. I mean, and that was probably close to 20 years ago. Wow. And it's just grown incrementally each year from there. And Katie, you were telling me you've been involved with it. Mm -hmm. What's it like for you as a former Special Olympics athlete to be involved with it. I, I, it's fun to plunge, it, it's fun, it's camaraderie with the officers that we, we have such, uh, athletes have such a relationship with them, it, it's fun to do stuff with them. Yep. And I imagine the first time it just had been shocking to it, jump it, into the it's, water? It's shocking, but it it's doesn't last long, the cold doesn't last long because the wa water is usually warmer than the air. So maybe walk someone through us, like if they want, if they're interested in being involved, how do they go about doing this? And it, there's multiple ways that people can become involved in the polar plunges statewide. I mean, like I said, it's over an eight-week period coming up. The first one is on January 26th this coming year, and then it ends the week of uh, March 15th um, up in Grand Rapids and War Road, Minnesota. But each weekend throughout that eight week period, um, anybody can go on to the website, which is plungemn.org, mm -hmm. and register themselves for any one or all of those plunges for that matter. I mean, this is something, like I said, occurs over that eight week period, and it's an individual event. I mean, some of the plunges are bigger than the others. Some, some are, are colder small, than others. Some are cold, <laughs> and we can never predict the weather, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but, you have to cut uh, through the ice to get to the water sometimes? All the time. All the time. All the time, yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it's like Kate said. I mean, it's a situation where, you know, it's that camaraderie between the athletes and those that come out to the individual plunges and, and actually assist with the fundraising portion of and it. And a competition, actually, can between be. two. It can yeah. be. Yeah. 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 So how did you get involved and why did you get involved, Molly? Um, so I started I back um, right in my senior year of college. I actually had, um, I interned at Special Olympics and just loved it and knew kind of where I wanted to end up. So I had some other jobs and um, in past with friends and um, past companies. I had done the plunge and just loved everything about Special Olympics. So really wanted to get back and then um, started 
a little over a year ago, so this will be my second plunge season. It's just great to work with the athletes and law enforcement and just see everyone that comes out. I mean, like we said, we have teams of um, the different delegations and athlete teams and law enforcement teams and businesses, and it's just everyone coming together for one day and jumping into cold water for a good cause. So. Yep. yep. <laughs> Sounds like heart stopping to me. <laughs> not so bad. It's not. Forget about it instantly. You yeah, get out, all you think of is the fun of it. Yeah, so. I'm sure. And then Katie, you were saying that you used to do multiple ones. Now you just do one, mm -hmm. but you you make multiple I plunges. I make multiple jumps. And why is that? It's it's fun. Again, it's the camaraderie. Um, I, I have different groups that I jump with. And, and you have a team yourself? I have if, a team if myself. If someone's interested in supporting your team, they can do, do that? How they go about doing that? Uh, go, if they go to plungemma.org and search for the Woodbury Blazing Stars. Uh-huh. And um, your plunge will be in January? Uh, Woodbury oh, is February, February 9th. February 9th, okay. Um, other people, what else should they know about the public I, I would say this. I mean, Kate's actually underselling herself here. I mean, she's responsible for actually creating the Woodbury Plunge. I mean, wow, if not for impressive. her endeavors with the city of Woodbury, um, there would no, there would not be a plunge in the city of Woodbury. So I guess for that matter, I mean, you know, it's one of the reasons why we're here today to support Key. I mean, without her efforts in working with the city, working with law enforcement, and working with Special Olympics, that plunge probably would not exist. And it's been a very successful plunge since it began over three years ago. So. To that, I mean, that's nice. Our relationship with the athletes and the staff at Special Olympics has allowed this to continue to grow the way it has. I mean, in addition to the plunges, there's multiple other events at many of these plunges. Include that we call it a cool school plunge, or trying to get the, the oh, schools okay. in each local area involved with plunge season as well, where we'll set aside separate times for them where they can come during school hours with the permission of their school administrators to come out and actually plunge separately from the plunge itself at that location. So again, you were mentioning the website that you can go and it tells you the list of all of the plunges and Correct. the events and locations and yep. go ahead and sign up and be a part of it. Absolutely, and if you don't want to do it, there's other events associated. We call it Two Chicken to Plunge, <laughs> where you can rent, register as a non-plunger but still raise funds for Special Olympics oh, as awesome. well. You just throw a rubber chicken into yeah. the water. So yeah. you still get to go up with your team and be a part of the whole event. You just don't have to actually jump in and get cold and wet like everyone else. You can just well, throw the rubber yes. chicken instead. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank and you for having us. Okay. Yes, thank you. And it's been great to have you with us again. So, And always great to have you with us thank as well, you. Katie. So, And congratulations on all that you do. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks. Still ahead, we'll have some more uh, to talk about on how to reduce holiday stress. So stay with us. When I was your age, I was just like you, fascinated by stars. <sighs> but now I get to search for life in the universe. And who knows, maybe life is looking for us too. So we're like aliens to them? Yeah. Does anyone want to be a scientist now? I do. Awesome. We need more girls in STEM. Maybe we can find aliens. Finally, what you can do to have a stress-free holiday and how practicing gratitude might help as well. And we're pleased to have back with us, it's been a while, as Rachel yes, Larson you. from Ways to Wellness, Fairview Health Services. So thank you for being with us. Thanks for letting me be here today. You always have great information. So what would be some simple things that our viewers watching right now that they can do to reduce the stress at this time of year? Right, this time of the year is, is rough on all of us uh, for various reasons, but one of the top things that we can do is to start saying no. And that means not saying yes to every party, every event, hosting this, doing that. If we can reserve some capacity and maybe margin, you might say, for things that matter to us most. That's funny, I just told you no to something this <laughs> before we started. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Which is, which is good, right? We need to have, have some it's boundaries to and to just pause and think about what will that mean for me and my family and my capacity. Because if we're right to the edge and we, we fully book, then that important thing comes up. And now we feel more stress because we have to say no to the thing that matters more or rewrite our schedule. And so keep some margin. That would be uh, number one. Number two, 
detach from the stress of the day and the negative emotions. I visualize, remember Scrooge in the movie Scrooge where yeah. I think Marley, I know he's got that big chain trailing behind him. Just all of the, the regret and the mistakes of his life, just holding on to all of them. And we get home from work for thinking about the conversation that went bad, this project that didn't go well, you know, fill in the blank. If we can just cut that at the door and think, how do I feel right now? Right now in this space. Try to space, live in that moment. How am I right now? And when we can really detach from that, it can make a huge difference in our stress levels. When we carry all that around with us, it, it does not serve us and we, right, we can't live in the moment. So those are the, the top, I guess the top two. And then of course, that margin that we reserve, now we can do some self-care. Now we can take care of ourselves so that we can be, be better for our families. And whatever makes you feel good, good help as well then in that time that you have? Right, right. Um, different things to, that make you feel good. I mean, exercising, getting enough sleep, putting good things in our body, and then that, that multiplies. And yep. how does practicing gratitude, how does that help in this reducing stress? Right, gratitude is, um, is incredible. Um, sometimes we, we, we pull away from it, and I'm not quite sure why we do it, but when we take the time, maybe 15 minutes a day, maybe even two minutes, 30 seconds a day, anything, to just be grateful, truly grateful for a few things, it can change our outlook on life. Um, there, we've, I've got an article here from the, I guess it was from the Forbes, from Forbes actually, and one of, one of the seven top benefits of gratitude is improved psychological health. And when we can truly be grateful for others, grateful for what we've got going on in our life, it reduces the feelings of depression and increases happiness, which can go a long way this time of year. That's amazing. You know, it's like a magic pill almost without any it, medicine. It is, yeah. but we forget to take it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like we need a pill box for gratitude or something like that. Yeah, I find it very helpful to do that toward the end of my day, you know, kind of what do I have to be thankful for today and be grateful for? That's awesome you do that. So you also, um, at Waste Wellness, you have some um, ways to, that people can de distress and, and what, you have a, a new program you were saying or? We do, it's called Energize and De-Stress and it's three one-on-one -on -one visits. The first one is, uh, well one of them is about self-compassion, another is about um, guided imagery and meditation, and another is about stress management. So it's a, the perfect package for this time of year and very affordable. Well, so everyone has a, a stress-free holiday. That's right. Yes, thank you for being with us, Rachel. It's always good to have you with us. And if they want more information, they can contact Waste Wellness. Then. Absolutely. Thank you, and have a great holiday. Thanks. Thanks, and we'd like to thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time on Inside Healthcare. See you then.